It's real. It happened in Springfield, Missouri. What's likely become the city's most perplexing case began on June 7th, 1992. Three women, Cheryl Levitt, her daughter Susie Streeter, and Susie's friend Stacy McCall, simply vanished. It is a mystery. Nobody knows what really happened. And they were gone in such unusual circumstances. No explanation for why they would have left behind their purses, their, their keys, their money, um, their cigarettes. Uh, smokers don't do that. Cars in the driveway, their their belongings, um, their clothes. It, it, that was what really was so scary. How did they take three people without leaving anything that connected them? I really truly believe it's the case that haunts the Springfield Police Department. There was no signs of struggle inside the house at all. And how it went down from there is almost impossible. Someone had to take complete control of those three persons. It's a case that received national attention. Have the police given you any theories on what might have happened to Stacy? A mystery that even decades later, people are still talking about. N nothing to explain this, this bizarre, mysterious disappearance. It's the craziest story, and it went on forever. Today I want to talk about the Springfield Three. Now this case is super disturbing, strange, and frustrating. There are very credible theories that people really believe are what happened. It's just like the circumstances are not allowing police to arrest certain people. It's just one of those cases that once you hear about it, you cannot get out of your mind, at least for me. I want to do what I usually do on my channel. Okay, I want to give you guys the facts, okay? Then we're going to discuss the theories, and then you can decide for yourself. So the whole thing started at 6 p.m.-ish on June 6, 1992. This was when Susie Streeter and her friend Stacy McCall had just graduated from Kickapoo High School in Springfield, Missouri. So Susie Streeter, she lived with her single mom, Cheryl. And Susie and her mom, Cheryl, they were extremely close. They had kind of a troubled relationship where Susie had moved out a couple times, but she always came back. And they were so close that a lot of times Susie would cancel plans with her friends to hang out with her mom. They had also just recently moved into a new home in Springfield, Missouri. And it was like two months ago before this graduation that they had moved. So after Susie hung out with her mom, she's like, all right, I'm going to go to my friend Janelle's house and from there we're going to go out and we're going to celebrate. So Susie drives to Janelle's house. Stacy, she was also going to Janelle's house and Stacy, Susie, and Janelle were then going to walk next door to a graduation party that was taking place right next door. Now this get-together was kind of a big deal because although Susie, Stacy, and Janelle were lifelong friends, they sort of drifted apart over time and Janelle was really the glue that was keeping them together because Stacy and Susie sort of drifted apart and started hanging out in different crowds. So like Stacy was hanging out with the popular kids whereas Susie was hanging out with like the troublemakers and they really weren't hanging out together as a trio anymore. It was either Janelle with Susie or Janelle with Stacy. But recently they decided they wanted to hang out a bit more. And so for graduation, they were all going to get together and spend the entire night together. And then from there, they were going to the next morning go to a water park together. That was the original plan. So it's around 8.30 p.m. on June 6th and Stacy, Susie, and Janelle are all at Janelle's house and they're like, okay, we're going to walk next door to go to the party. From there, they end up taking rides with different friends and they would end up going to a few more parties throughout the night. They're at another party now and it's around 10.30 p.m. and that's when Stacy calls her mom Janice. She tells her mom like, hey, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to spend the night at Janelle's house. And then from there, we're all going to go to the water park. So Janice is like, okay, cool. Sounds good. Call me in the morning. Stacy's like, okay. And that's it. That would be the last time that Janice would speak to her daughter, Stacy. The three girls are now at another party and now it's around 1.30 a.m. 
it was like really loud. And so the neighbor ends up calling the cops. Cops show up, they break up the party. That's when Susie, Stacy, and Janelle go back to Janelle's home where they were going to spend the night. But that's not what ended up happening. What ended up happening is that when Stacy and Susie got to Janelle's, they realized that there were like a lot of people there because Janelle had family visiting from out of town. And so like Janelle was sleeping on the couch. There really wasn't anywhere for Susie and Stacy to sleep other than the floor, basically. And so Susie's like, listen, my mom just got a new king size waterbed as a gift for me for graduation. And so Stacy, you can sleep in the waterbed. I'll sleep in my bed. Let's go back to my place. It'll be way more comfortable. And then in the morning, we'll come back to Janelle's and then we'll all go to the water park instead of spending the night here. So Stacy agrees and she doesn't tell her mom though because it's like 1.30 in the morning. Maybe she thought she didn't want to call her mom. Susie and Stacy end up going to Susie's house. What happens after that? No one really knows because the next morning at around 8, 9 a.m., Susie and Stacy were supposed to be at Janelle's so they could all go to the water park, but they never showed up. And so at around 9 a.m., Janelle calls Susie's home. No one picks up. She leaves a message. Then it's like noon and she still hasn't heard back from Susie or Stacy. They're not there. And so she's like, okay, I'm going to go to Susie's and see what's going on. So she goes with her boyfriend, Mike, Janelle and Mike together, get in the car and they go to Susie's house. When they get there, they notice that all three cars are there. Susie's mom, Cheryl's cars in the carport, her daughter, Susie's car. And behind Susie's car is Stacy's car. So Janelle's like, oh, you know, like she's thinking they probably just like overslept. So Janelle was barefoot. And when she got out of the car and started walking to the front door, she noticed that there was glass on the floor. She then realizes that the, the lamp like shade to the light on the front porch was busted. It was broken. The light bulb itself was intact and it was still on, but, but the glass surrounding it was broken. And that's why there was glass on the floor. So Mike, Janelle's boyfriend, decides to sweep where she was barefoot. And also they said it was a favor for Cheryl, uh, Susie's mom, to just like sweep it and get it out of the way. They don't really think anything of it. Janelle then notices that the front door is unlocked. So she opens the door and as she opens the door to go in, the dog, Susie and Cheryl's dog, Cinnamon, was a little Yorkie, was like barking like crazy, not the typical way the dog would bark because the dog knew Janelle. When Cinnamon realized that it was Janelle, Cinnamon jumped into Janelle's arms and she like kind of was shaking. The light in the entryway was turned off and it was dark. So Janelle turns the light on and she starts walking around and calling for Susie, Cheryl, Stacy, no answer. She then starts to notice things. The first thing she notices is that all three of their purses are on the floor next to each other. Then she notices that next to the waterbed were Stacy's sandals that she wore that night, her shorts that were neatly folded on top of the sandals, and later on they would find out that the jewelry that Stacy wore was inside her pocket. Then Janelle goes into Susie's room and she notices it's kind of messy and that the bed sheets are pulled back. And then when she goes into the bathroom, she sees that there's like towels that indicate that the girls washed the makeup off their face and put the towels in the hamper. It looks like they came home, they washed their face, they took off their jewelry, they got undressed. Like it seems like they were getting ready for bed, but still sh no one's answering. She goes to Cheryl's room and Cheryl's bed looks like someone's been sleeping in there, but Cheryl isn't there. So she's like, what is going on? And it's really weird because she also notices that Cheryl and Susie, who both smoke cigarettes heavily and never go anywhere without their smokes, their cigarettes are left. 
and Stacy, I don't know if you can hear that, but there's an ambulance. If not, I just told you for no reason. Stacy had medication for migraines that she always took with her and would need, and that medication was there too. So they're not there, but their purses, their medication, their cigarettes are all there. Then while Janelle was there, the phone rings. She picks up the phone and she says she got a strange and disturbing call. She said there was a male on the other end who said inappropriate, 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 lewd things of a sexual nature. So she hangs up the phone and the phone rings again, same person, same thing. She hangs up again. So now Janelle and Mike are like, where are they also in the home are all their car keys to the cars that were in the driveway. So it's like, did they go somewhere? And if they did, they didn't take anything with them. They they don't have their keys. They don't have their car. They don't have their purses. They don't have their medication, their smokes, the door is unlocked. Now things are starting to look a little scary. It was even this chunk of cash that was in Cheryl, the mom's purse. In the meantime, Janice, Stacy's mom, is wondering why she hasn't heard from Stacy. Because remember, right? Janice thinks that Stacy slept at Janelle's home and was going to call her in the morning. Well, now it's past noon and she hasn't heard from Stacy. So she calls Janelle's home. Janelle isn't there. Janelle is in Susie and Cheryl's home trying to find them, right? The sister answers, like Janelle's sister answers. That's when Janice found out that Stacy never spent the night at Janelle's. So Janice ends up getting in touch with Janelle, and that's when she found out that Janelle and Mike were looking for Stacy, Susie, and Cheryl, and that they weren't there at the home. And then when Janice found out that the purses were there and like her daughter's medication was there, she began to worry and she ends up getting in the car and going to Cheryl and Susie's home. So when Janice arrives at Susie and Cheryl's home, there are already a bunch of people there because word is spreading and so family and friends are there inside the home trying to figure out what happened. And they're also like touching things and doing things in the house. Like the, the house was slightly messy. They started straightening up, cleaning up. And this is all before cops ever come into the house. There's already like 18 people who have been in and out of this house. So when Janice gets there and assesses the situation, she realizes like something is wrong, like something is not right. And she calls the cops from the house phone at Susie and Cheryl's house. She tells them what happened. And then after she gets off the phone with police, she checks the messages that were on the answering machine. She says that there was a quote, strange message on the machine. She also says that that message was accidentally deleted. Now, when I read up on this, I found that like the details were fuzzy because there's some information that says that she accidentally deleted the message and there's no information on what the message is. And then I found other information that says that police heard the message and even though it was deleted, they knew what was in the message, but they just didn't reveal it to the public because what we do know is that police found that message to be relevant to the women's disappearance and that they thought that there was a clue in the message and they also did not think it was connected to the lewd inappropriate calls that Janelle had gotten earlier when she was first there. Am I making sense? It's weird. When the officer gets there, he looks around and he notices a few more things. He notices that in Susie's bedroom, the blinds, okay, you know when you like open them up and you can look, you know, through the blinds, he notices that two of the blinds were were separated like someone was looking outside from Susie's room. In the beginning, he tells Janice like, hey, what if they just continued going out and partying? That's when Janice says, well, if Stacy, my daughter, went out with them, she didn't have any pants on because her shorts are right here. And so the officer is like, yeah, but she could have borrowed clothes from Susie. 
And Janice says no, because she would not fit her clothes because they had, they were different sizes. And so after they assess the situation again, the officer decides that this seems like a missing persons case and they suspect foul play. Once that was established, at this point, police are like, we need to secure the scene because there's like so many people here. And so they tell everyone to leave and then they secure the home, right? There's like the police caution tape all around it. And the neighbors are now like, what's going on? These people, they just moved in two months ago. And now there's like caution tape everywhere. And that's when the case and the investigation Began. Immediately, the story was all over the news, and that was a choice that was made by the police chief to publicize everything to, to get tips from the community. And this would end up being very controversial and it could have ruined the case, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Literally, the next day, there were flyers everywhere, the news was talking about it, and the women's descriptions were publicized everywhere. Cheryl Levitt, that is the mom. She was 47 at the time she went missing, and she was described as a white female, 5 feet, 0 inches, 110 pounds. She had short, bleach blonde hair, brown eyes, and pierced ears. Her daughter, Susie Streeter, was 19 when she vanished, and she was 5 foot 2, 102 pounds, and she had shoulder-length blonde hair and brown eyes. She also had some distinguishable features, which was a three and a half inch scar on her upper right forearm. She also had a small tumor on the left corner of her mouth that made it look like she had something in her mouth, and she was described as having large teeth, and she also had pierced ears with her left ear pierced twice. Stacy was 18, and she was described as five foot three, 120 pounds. She had long, dark blonde hair, blue eyes, and a dimple in the middle of her chin. Two days after the girls went missing, the, the, the Springfield Police Department already called the FBI to get involved. They did something that the police chief called a full court press, which is when they just use all their resources and all their manpower right away. They, he took all the detectives off of any other case and put them all on this case, and it was just like full on, full court press. A few days after the girls went missing, there was a lead involving a green van. This is a vehicle that was seen in the area of 1717 East Del Mar. There was a woman who said that she witnessed in the wee hours of the morning while she was sitting on her porch and watching the sunrise, she noticed a green van that was an older model Dodge and it pulled into the driveway right next door to hers. So she's looking at it from the porch and she sees a girl that looks exactly like Susie. And she says she then hears the voice of a man that she could not see saying, don't do anything stupid. She thought it was odd and she didn't really say anything for a few days because she claims she was afraid. But then she found the courage and she went to police and she told them about this van. Now she was not the only one to tell police about an older model Dodge van that had a girl in the driver's seat who looked like Susie driving it. This time the van was parked and it was parked near a grocery store that was near Susie and Cheryl's home and he said that it appeared as though the girl was waiting for someone who was inside the grocery store but he said that something about it seemed strange like her demeanor and the van and the whole thing seemed strange and so he wrote down the license plate number on a newspaper because he thought it was so odd. Then, for some reason, he ends up throwing away the newspaper. But he goes to police when he hears about this disappearance and he tells them what he saw. They end up hypnotizing him to try to get the license plate number from, I guess, the recesses of his memory, and they can only get the first three numbers. They run those numbers and the description in the national database and it doesn't match any vehicle. The van is going to end up being like a pretty big part of the case because the first police really felt like this was going to lead to something. They even had a lookalike van that they parked in front of the police station to like jog people's memory. They, they never really confirmed that this was the vehicle of someone who did something to the women. Although you'll see later on, this van comes up again. Right away, a few suspects emerge just based on police looking into the women's past. 
specifically Susie, because there were two ex-boyfriends that police were suspecting, Susie's exes, as well as Susie's brother and Cheryl's son, Bart. So let's first start with Dustin, who is Susie's ex. According to police, they looked at Dustin because they felt like he had a motive and he had means and opportunity. And the reason why is because, first of all, Dustin was a grave robber. Yes, he and two of his friends, they actually went to a mausoleum in the area and they stole $30, okay, worth of gold fillings from, like, a corpse, like from the skull, like the, t the teeth filling. They stole it. Yes, evil. And this happened a few months before the women disappeared. And Susie, okay, she spoke to police about it, gave them information, and was rumored to be testifying in court against Dustin in the future soon. So that's the motive, but also police were able to find opportunity because Dustin and the two friends who he robbed the grave with were in the area near Susie and Cheryl's home at the time of their disappearance. So they bring Dustin in for questioning and he denies it. And then they ask him to take a lie detector test. Remember, this is 1992. They ask him to take a lie detector test and he agrees. And according to police, he passed the test. Based off of that, they cleared him as a suspect and kept looking. The next person they questioned was another one of Susie's exes. Remember, when Stacy and Susie drifted apart, like Susie was hanging out with the rough crowd, the troublemakers, and Stacy was with the popular kids. So uh, Susie's boyfriends were kind of like shady because this other guy that she broke up with like months before she went missing was a guy called Mike Kovacs. Susie had actually taken a restraining order out on Mike. So let me tell you what happened. So Susie and Mike were together for two years before they broke up. According to Susie, the physical violence in their relationship started when she moved in with Mike and Mike lived with his grandma. And according to Mike's grandma, she witnessed the fighting. I want to read you what she said. Okay. She says, sometimes when you're a teenager, the apron strings are just too tight. She said she saw Susie and Mike fight often, but he never really hurt her. They would scuffle around a bit. She said it was sort of like him just pushing her around and physically shoving her away from him. She said the fights often started when Susie tried to slap Mike. Quote, you know, naturally when that happens, your impulse is to strike back. He was a growing boy and maybe sometimes he'd shove her too hard and she'd go into the furniture or something. Mike's still just a little kid, remember? She said, you've got to be pretty grown up to know you just don't hit a woman. Okay, so that's what the grandma said. Mike doesn't deny getting into these physical fights with her and he downplays it. He's like, you're like, I just shoved her around and like shoved her around a little bit. So Susie ends up breaking up with Mike and moving back in with her mom. And this was September, the year prior to when they went missing in June. So about eight months before she went missing, she breaks up with Mike. A month after she breaks up with Mike, she ends up filing a restraining order against Mike. According to Susie, she said that Mike beat her up, slashed her tires, called her home to threaten her, would show up to her school, her home, her work to harass her. And although Mike did admit to them being physical, he denied the allegations in the restraining order. And he said, quote, after we broke up, I never spoke to her again. I couldn't have done those things because I didn't talk to her. But in these old newspaper clippings that I found, when Susie's coworkers were interviewed by reporters, they claimed that they had to walk Susie to her car after work because she was so afraid of Mike. When Susie filed this restraining order in October, they ended up giving her like a temporary one for 10 days pending a hearing to see if it was going to stick. And that hearing was November 5th. But Susie never went to the hearing. Because she didn't go to the hearing, the restraining order expired. And then months later, 
she would vanish. It was seven months after she missed the hearing date that she, Stacy, and her mom, Cheryl, disappeared. Based on all of this, police go and they bring Mike in for questioning. Mike is asked where he was when they disappeared, and he claims he was alone. But they couldn't corroborate this information. So again, just like they did with Dustin, they're like, will you take a lie detector test? And Mike agrees. He takes the polygraph, and just like Dustin, he passes the polygraph. And so police are like, okay, he's no longer a suspect. Let's move on. The next suspect, though, was actually Susie's brother, Bart. Bart Streeter was actually estranged from his mom and his sister. And they kind of all had a bit of a volatile relationship because Susie would move out of her mom's place a couple times. Like one time she went with Mike, broke up with him, went back to her mom. And another time when she moved out of her mom's place, she went and stayed with her brother, Bart. But then they had a falling out and she left her brothers to go stay with her mom. And Bart was also kind of a little bit rocky with his mom. And according to Bart, the reason why he was estranged is, quote, because we had complications over one of Suzanne's boyfriends. Interesting. When police asked Bart, where were you when they went missing? He says that he was passed out drunk. And so again, they're like, will you take a polygraph? And he says, yes. According to police, he passes and he's cleared. Keep in mind, all of these developments are being publicized on the news. And it started as a local story, but eventually it blows up and becomes a national story. It's like America's Most Wanted, 48 Hours, like all of those would end up talking about this case. And so that's when a couple in Florida would call the Springfield police and bring another suspect on their radar. And this guy is going to play a huge part in the case. His name is Robert Cox. This couple lived in Florida, and their 19-year-old daughter was brutally kidnapped, R-worded, and killed. And they believe it was Robert Cox who did it. And actually, Robert Cox was convicted and found guilty of doing it, but there's a twist. So this is what happened. Their daughter, Sharon, was driving home from Disney World, and she was 19 at the time. She was then intercepted at some point and kidnapped from her vehicle and later on she would be found stuffed in a sewer. This sewer was 300 feet away from a motel and Robert Cox was one of the guests at that motel. When police found Sharon's car there was evidence in there that was a footprint of a military boot as well as blood and hair. Now keep in mind, this happened in 1978. So we're not, we don't have DNA or any of that. Then they go and question the people at the motel. That's when they find out that Robert Cox was a army ranger who was wearing military boots that matched the prints that were in Sharon's car. They also found out that when he came home, the night that Sharon went missing, when he like got back to the motel, he was bleeding from his mouth because a half an inch of his tongue was missing. And Robert claimed he got into a fight and bit on his tongue and that's what happened. But a nurse would determine that that was impossible because of the way like the bite marks were that someone else bit his tongue off, essentially, an inch of it. And police believe that someone was Sharon, who was fighting for her life. And so they would end up trying to match. It wasn't DNA match, but they would match the hair and the blood to being a similar type as Robert Cox's hair and blood, and that the boot prints matched his boots. And based on that, they arrest him. The jury convicts him of killing Sharon, and he gets life. Not life, sorry, the death penalty. He appeals and appeals and appeals. And by the time it reaches the Florida Supreme Court, the Florida Supreme Court overturns Robert Cox's conviction. They say that there's not enough substantial evidence to convict him. And 
he is released in 1990. Sharon's parents, they warn the judges like, he's going to kill again. And they start keeping tabs on him, like they're calling his parole officer, they're seeing where he is. And that's how they knew that when he got released in 1990, he went to Springfield, Missouri, his hometown. So when Sharon's parents were watching the news and they heard of the Springfield Three, they felt like this is too much of a coincidence. Like, did Robert do this? And when they called the cops to tell them about Robert Cox, the police then found out from Janice, Stacy's mom, that Robert Cox worked for Stacy's dad. Actually, he had worked with the same place that my husband worked at Reliable Chevrolet. Janice said he very well could have seen Stacy when she and her sisters would visit their father at work. It's not far-fetched that he would follow her home and do something to her like he did to Sharon and got away with it. Am I making sense? Police bring Robert Cox in for questioning and they claim that he has a rock-solid alibi and that is he said that the morning that the women disappeared, he was at church. So wholesome. He was at church with his girlfriend. And so they call his girlfriend and she says, yes, he was with me. We were at church. And they're like, okay, he's innocent. And they let him go. Now the gag is later on, it would be revealed that the girlfriend lied to police and said that Robert was with her when in fact he wasn't. But we're going to get into that later because I need to tell you what happened next in timeline order. So this brings me to the controversy because there was a lot of controversy with police and what happened and the infighting and like it was a whole thing. We were overwhelmed. We were confronted with issues that we had never been confronted with before. There was infighting between the detectives and the police chief because the police chief, his name by the way, is Terry Knowles. There's like certain protocols and ways that cases like these are handled and he did it n nothing like that. Everything he did did not go along with what they traditionally do. And the detectives felt like he did not let them do their job and in fact hindered the case because he kept interfering and made things worse. For example, he detectives felt like he did not have faith in their abilities, and so he would not let them do their jobs. And he would come in there, and he would meddle, and he would rule out suspects by himself, the only person, just say, no, this person is not a suspect. And then there were psychics that would call, and they would follow everything just because the psychic said, I had a vision. This one quote says, instead of coming into the department and working the phones, letting one lead prompt another as they would on any normal major investigation, detectives were mostly getting tip cards. Everything from sightings to suspicious activity to run down. Some sat answering the phones and listening to callers' concerns. Veteran detectives were baffled by this new game plan. Even the former assistant prosecutor came out and spoke against the police chief and what the police chief did. He said, quote, This was clearly the most micromanaged case I've ever seen. Seasoned detectives were not allowed to use their experience and judgment in this investigation. This is the only case where that happened, and I don't understand that. This assistant prosecutor, his name is Daryl Moore, and he said that the police chief jeopardized the case essentially by leaking way too much information to the media. He said that when he saw the 48 hours special, that it was airing footage of the suspects being polygraphed. He couldn't believe it. Quote, that's a total violation of the disciplinary rules. We can't even say whether or not polygraphs have been done, much less allow the media to film it. If the defense was alleging police misconduct, it would have been true. But that was done by one person, the chief. This was the assistant prosecutor. The lead prosecutor, he actually ended up writing a letter to the police chief. And in this letter, he basically tells the police chief, if you don't stop sharing information to the public, there are going to be legal repercussions. And so the police chief, Terry Knowles, he pushes back on these allegations. He doesn't deny that he was, quote, hands-on, but he feels like it didn't hinder the case and that it was necessary and that he was getting the information out to the public because he felt like it was necessary to do that. The more people that we can make aware of the situation we're faced with, 
the better chance we have of somebody coming forward. And he thinks that his approach didn't undermine the case, that the lack of evidence and like the scenes being disturbed was what hindered the case. Because in addition to the infighting, there was another huge problem with the case. And that was that the crime scene was beyond contaminated and evidence that was valuable was completely disturbed. Remember how I told you that by the time police were called to Cheryl and Susie's home, 18 people had been in and out of the house, that the glass was sweeped, swept, uh, the broken glass was swept and discarded, which was crucial to figure out what happened there. People had like straightened up and cleaned the house, so we don't even know what it really looked like. The fingerprints, they said that it was damn near pointless to get the fingerprints because they were so many prints of people and by the time the police came in they didn't even know who had exactly came and gone and so they really did not have evidence to go off of all they had was tips okay literally they had just the tips speaking of tips remember how i told you about robert cox and how he was a utility worker uh in the area well there was this weird letter that was found in a newspaper rack. It was a news rack is what it's referred to. I had to Google it. And it's like, remember back in the day when we had newspapers and then sometimes on the street, there would be these like metal boxes and you can put in some coins and the door opens and you grab a newspaper. It's like, I remember when they were newspapers. Well, apparently... In one of these news racks, there was a letter, and in the letter, there was an apartment complex that was drawn, and then there was writing next to it that said, use ruse of gas man, checking for leak. And this apartment complex, police were able to locate it, and they searched it, and of course, nothing came of it. Okay, that's the theme here. The next day, there was another tip, and this tip was from neighbors who said that there was a transient man who was hanging around near Susie and Cheryl's home in the days leading up to the disappearance. And they gave a description of a man with long hair and a long beard. And so police have this sketch and they publicize it and nobody ever found this guy. But then there was another tip that came in that kind of made the timeline a bit more fuzzy if it was true, because at the time police believed that the girls showed up to the home at like 2.30. They think that Cheryl was asleep and that the girls just got ready to go to bed and then something happened. But this tip that came in was from a waitress who worked at Cheryl's favorite restaurant, which was called, um, what was it called? George's Steakhouse. This waitress says that she saw Stacy, Susie, and Cheryl at this restaurant in the hours between like around 1 and 3 a.m. the morning that they supposedly disappeared and that they came in alone and fine and they left alone. The only thing she noticed was that Susie seemed very giddy, like she was intoxicated and that her mom Cheryl was trying to calm her down. So this was a little confusing because if they went out to eat at the steakhouse, uh, how did they pay? if their purses were left behind and they were alone. Why, what was Stacy wearing if she didn't have the shorts that she left there? Was she, was she wearing someone else's clothing? And why would they leave the door unlocked and not take anything with them? And it just was strange. What people also found was strange was why they would go out to this restaurant when there was a cake for Susie that her mom had gotten that said, congrats, Suze, like a graduation cake that was in the fridge that was untouched. They feel like if they were going to celebrate and wanted something, wouldn't they take the cake that was already in the fridge? Why would they go out with none of their belongings to the steakhouse? It was weird. Again, like many of the tips, it would create more questions than answers, and it would also lead nowhere. Remember Bart Streeter, Cheryl's son, Susie's brother? Well, he ends up quitting his job and leaving Springfield, Missouri for good. And 
he is going to factor in later when something crazy happens that he did in 2019 that would totally, totally put him back on the radar as being a suspect. But I want to go in order, okay? So September 15, a few months after they went missing, he leaves Springfield, Missouri, quits his job, and is gone. New Year's Eve, 1992. America's Most Wanted heirs, and they're asking for tips on the Springfield 3 case. And a man calls in and has what is described by police as very credible information. And some way, somehow, this operator that picked up the phone for America's Most Wanted was trying to transfer the caller to the Springfield police. And the call gets disconnected and they can't get back in touch with this person. The police come out and they publicly ask for this man who called to call them, but he never does and they can never reach him. And Nothing comes from that either. It's like, oh my God, I want to pull my hair off. Now it's 1993, Valentine's Day, February 14th. And police come out and they make an announcement. They say, listen, we are starting to think that this could be a serial killer. It could even be more than one person. We don't know much more than that, but there are certain suspects that are not people who knew the victims that we now are suspecting. So I want to talk about those suspects. The first one is someone called Gerald Carnahan. Now this guy was a businessman and he is a dick. He's, he's evil. He's bad. I don't like him because he did some bad things. In 1985, okay, he beat and killed a woman called Jackie Johns and her body was dumped in Lake Springfield. Right away, police named him as a suspect, and they accused him of lying about his alibi, but a judge dismissed the charges, but later on, it would be proven through DNA that he did kill her. But before that happened, he was implicated in another crime. Police named him as a suspect in the death in 1987 of a woman called Debbie Sue Lewis. And then it gets worse. In the spring of 1993, less than a year after they went missing, the Springfield Three, Gerald gets arrested. What is he trying to do? Kidnap a woman from a sidewalk, okay? And he ends up serving two years in prison for that. And so, based on this history and the fact that he's in the area, the Springfield police want to look into him as a potential suspect. But he denied any involvement in the crime. Then there was another suspect that did not know them personally that police thought could have been involved. And this guy is Stephen Garrison. So he was part of a motorcycle gang at the time. And in 1993, he told police he knew what happened to the Springfield Three. He was in jail at the time. And so he was trying to leverage it to like get out of jail. He said he heard people confess to killing the women at a party where people were doing drugs. And he said that their bodies were taken to a hog farm in Webster County. And police found him to be credible because he had information that they had not released to the public. So they end up getting a judge to lower his bail and they bail him out. They put him in a hotel. And what does this guy do? This dude runs away. He flees. And a few days later, he breaks into a woman's apartment in Springfield and attacks her. Okay. Thankfully, she survived. She testified against him and he got 40 years for that. Police then went to the hog farm that he claimed he heard the bodies were buried in. Police come out and say they found items, but they don't specify what they found. And the search warrant results were sealed. And although I keep saying nothing came from it, nothing came from it, a point that people like to bring up is that these suspects that police have not charged are already in prison. And so maybe it's because they're already in prison and they don't want to like waste their opportunity and try to charge them and it doesn't stick that they're not doing anything and they're waiting for more information. I don't know. That's a theory. Remember Robert Cox. Okay. Well, remember how I told you that 
years later, his girlfriend would admit to lying about the alibi. Well, this is years later. It is now 1995, and Robert Cox fucks up big time. He does something really stupid, and he gets arrested in Texas. What does he do? He gets arrested for aggravated robbery because he held up a child at gunpoint. Um, he gets life. He gets life in Texas for holding a child at gunpoint during a robbery. So police then speak to Robert's now ex-girlfriend and she says, oh yeah, I lied. He called me and told me to say that he was with me at church, but really he wasn't. When that information comes out, Springfield police go to Texas to interview him again. And Robert is now fucking with them. He's like, oh mm, yeah, I know where they are. <laughs> I know where they are. I know that they're dead. I know where they're buried, um, but I'm not going to tell you. And they say he smirked and refused to say anything else. Although he didn't talk to police, he then starts talking to the media. I know that they're dead. I'll say that. I know that. That's not theory. Yeah, but I know that they're just, I just know that they're dead. That's not my theory. I just know that. He's like, uh, not only do I know where they are, and what happened and that they're dead, um, I know that they're never going to be found. Springfield police take all this information to a grand jury. They have his girlfriend, sorry, ex-girlfriend, testify saying that she lied about the alibi. They tell them about the interview where he said he knew where they were and that they were dead. And for whatever reason, the grand jury does not charge Robert Cox. Some people, including officers, believe that Robert Cox is totally involved and other people think that he has nothing to do with this and is just trying to get attention and like is thriving off of it. A year after that in 1997, the five-year anniversary of the disappearance rolls around and two major things happen. Cheryl and Susie's family, they ask the court to declare them legally dead and the court does. And then also the police come out and they say, we cannot allocate any more resources to this case. You know, we'll still take tips, but essentially it is now a cold case. Janice, Stacy's mom, she is like, I will never declare my daughter dead unless I find a body. She said, quote, until I know 100% that Stacy is deceased, I will never declare her dead. They're going to have to find some remains somewhere before I call her legally dead. It's not for any reason other than if I do and she's not dead, think of how mad she'd be when she gets back. The case is cold and it stays that way until 2011. Sorry, lies. 2001. In 2001, police decide to put fresh eyes on the cold cases that they have and one of those cases is the Springfield 3. So now you've got these new officers and they are looking at it with, quote, fresh eyes. The police reach out to Robert Cox again. They write him a letter in prison and they ask to speak to him and he refuses. So then they go out and they ask the public for tips and they get new tips. And one of these tips was about the green van. This tip claimed that the women and the green van were buried at a farm about an hour south of Springfield and so police take cadaver dogs to the farm and the dogs hit. They hit in three different areas. And so then police go in and they start digging it up and they find pieces of a green vehicle as well as what looked to be blood in the soil. They couldn't really determine much from the metal, the green metal of the vehicle because it was a small piece but they did send the blood for DNA testing. And remember, this is like around 2003 when this happens. So technology is a little bit better and they send it to this very special lab. But unfortunately, the results are inconclusive. So frustrating, so frustrating. And then something huge happens. Remember Bart, okay, how I told you that he left Springfield, quit his job and just kind of disappeared. Well, he comes back into the picture in a very bad way. He gets arrested in February of 2019 
The 54-year-old was arrested in late February for allegedly trying to abduct a 15-year-old girl at a nail salon in Tennessee. So when that came out, people were speculating like, oh my God, he tried to kidnap a woman in 2019. He was a suspect back then. Like, could it have been the brother all along? Bart's family came out and they defended him. The streeters say the charges are exaggerated and they believe the story was corrupted when relayed to the media. And they're like, he's always cooperated with police and he's been cleared. And no, he has nothing to do with this. Okay, now it's 2023. It's been like 31 years since they went missing. It's so frustrating because there seem to be so many good leads that go nowhere. And one of the biggest things that people talk about is the stupid polygraph lie detector bullshit because a lot of you know, if you are interested in true crime, I know because you guys are in my comments telling me all the time that polygraphs are almost useless. Like not completely, but they're not admissible in court. They can be faked. And Back in the 90s, the, the, the technology for that was probably way shittier than they are now. And even now, they're not admissible. So a lot of these people were ruled out off of polygraphs. The case is still open. There is a $43,000 reward. And if anyone has information, they're encouraged to either use the link for Crime Stoppers that I have linked in the description below. You can do that anonymously, or you can always call the Springfield, Missouri Police Department directly if you have any information. So those are the facts, okay? Now I want to talk about the theories. According to police and many people who follow the case, there are really like three major theories that people talk about. The first one is that Cheryl, the mom, was the target. And the reason for that is that people say that she was the only one who was supposed to be there that night. So if someone knew her, and was trying to do something to her, they would have known that she was alone or was supposed to be alone because that's what she told people, that her daughter was going out and graduated and is going to be spending the night away. But if they came there and they saw that there were two additional cars in the driveway, would they still follow through if they were waiting for her to be alone? I don't know. That theory kind of like, mm, I'm not so sure. The other theory is that Susie was the target. And I can kind of believe that one. And I'll tell you why. Because she had the most like people that were messing with her. Like she had a restraining order out on this guy. And then the other dude, she was a, like a criminal. And it wasn't violent crime, but she was like going to snitch on him. And then there was like the weird thing with the brother. So it seems like there were a few people who had means, motive, and opportunity to hurt Susie. So if they were following her, either when she was at the parties or something, and they knew Stacy was there, and it still didn't deter them because maybe it was more than one person, or maybe they had a weapon, and they felt that they could take them, that seems a bit more feasible than someone who was waiting for Cheryl and still did it anyway, when she, even after Susie and Stacy came home. Does that make sense? And then the last theory, which this one... A lot of people think could be the case is that it was random or a crime of opportunity, meaning someone they didn't know or someone that was stalking them and saw them, wanted to do something to them, and that's how it happened, and that they used some kind of a ruse. So if they were somehow lured out of the home because the door was unlocked, there was no signs of a struggle, could the breaking of the porch light have been part of the ruse? If it was Robert Cox with the utility, could he have made it seem like something popped and like they, there was a gas leak, they needed to check, so they had to come out, like rush out of the house without taking anything, and then from there they were kidnapped? Could that have been what happened? Because remember, the blinds were separated in Susie's room. So if that breaking of the uh, lamp was loud and it caught Susie's attention and she opened it and looked out and then either saw someone she recognized maybe or someone who she may have trusted someone in a uniform or something and they lied to her and somehow got her to get out of the house because if you think about the van and the sightings right it was always Susie that was seen driving the van so could it be 
that someone knew Susie could control Susie and use her mom and her friend as sort of like blackmail. Like, if you don't do this, I'm going to hurt them. And then drive here, go here, do this. You know? And so about whether or not there were one or more people involved, this is what the FBI and the police theorize. According to an FBI profiler, they say that they think one person probably did it and that if they had a weapon, that would have been enough to like control all three. They also believe that it was probably just one person because they think that if it was more than one person over all these years, that like at least one person would have said something. Another thing that investigators say, which also lends credence to people thinking that the van was involved, is that they think that whoever did it needed a large vehicle to be able to put three women in the car. And it was probably a van, okay? So were Cheryl and Stacy put into the back of the van at gunpoint and Susie made to drive the van and the kidnapper was hiding in the back and when the woman heard him say, don't do anything stupid, he was threatening her. But then when that man saw her parked at the grocery store near the home and she seemed like she was waiting for someone, that makes me think that maybe it was more than one kidnapper because if that one kidnapper had left and was in the store, unless they had the girl somewhere else, but then she could have asked for help. I don't know. I would love to know what you guys think. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.